Well, looks like we have uh, some attendees. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started. We're going to give a little time for everyone to come on board here. We're expecting about 200 people. So it's uh, rapidly climbing that number. We're closing up on 50. Give it a few minutes and then we'll get started. Lydell, I like to always find out where people are joining us from. If they want to put in the chat, maybe what uh, city they're in within uh, North County. That would be awesome. We have some ideas. Vista, Fallbrook, Oceanside, Vista, San Carlos, Sarah Mesa, San Diego, Oceanside, Carlsbad. Awesome. Well, you guys are in for a treat because this is going to be a great webinar. It really is. Yeah. Power panelists, as, as I like to say. <laughs> oh. Fantastic. Wow, look at that. I saw one from Ramona as well. Yeah, look, San Marcos, more Oceanside, a Cardiff. Another San Diego, Vista, unincorporated San Diego. Welcome. La Jolla, welcome. San Diego, Carlsbad. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Ash from Fallbrook. Welcome. So we're about, we're at about 63. Let's give it a couple more. See where this goes. I got to tell you, I'm excited. I've done this several times, been the moderator for ADUs. Um, and I tell you, this, this panel is my power panel. You guys are outstanding. Yeah, and I, I got my pencil or my pen. I got my paper ready for notes. I got popcorn right over there if I need it. You guys sit back, relax, strap in your seat belts, make sure you have a pen and some paper to write on to ask questions. And um, yeah, we're gonna get this thing started. So, I'm Lydell Fleming. I am your real estate guy with a purple tie. And I happen to be a director for the North San Diego County Realtors. Um, we do this, we try and do this as often as we can, put together these kind of panelists and, and have different subjects. Uh, this particular one is, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very fluid. It's, it's, a moving, um, it's a moving target. And it's always nice to get updates and, and uh, we're getting updates literally from the best here in San Diego. So without further ado, I believe we're gonna start off with what happens to be my favorite mayor. And I say that and I'm on record saying it. So, <laughs> so Mayor Rebecca Jones, a longtime San Marcos resident and community leader has served our community for over 16 years. She served on the city council from 2007 to 2018, serving as vice mayor from 2012 to 2018, and was selected to her first term as mayor in 2018. In addition to her role as mayor, Rebecca represents San Diego on the San Diego Association of Governments. And if you're not familiar with SANDAG, She's, she's the person to talk to. She's the board of directors where she advocates for transportation solutions and the, that benefits San Marcos residents. Prior to joining San Marcos City Council, Rebecca was an active community volunteer leader. She served as a member of the San Marcos Creek specific plan task force from 2005 to 2007 and as adv advisory board member of the San Marcos Boys and Girls Club for more than a decade. She also co-owned her own small business in furniture marketing, 
for over 20 years. And in her spare time, Rebecca hosts the inspirational, the she-eo lead, not CEO, she-eo lead. It's a podcast that highlights women in leadership and their journey that led them to their career. And with no further ado, Rebecca Jones, Mayor Jones, how are you? I'm awesome. Thank you so much for having me today. And I think my perspective is going to be very different than anyone else's because I'm the, I'm the mayor of a, a city of almost 100,000 people. And like you said, I've been serving quite a while. This is my 16th year in elected office. Love doing it, uh, but it is definitely a challenge because we've got a lot going on in San Marcos specifically. Uh, but, but when you talk about housing, I believe that everyone should have an opportunity for housing, whether it's uh, deed restricted, affordable housing, whether it's workforce housing, and then also you know the higher upper end. Uh, but it's a it's a housing ladder, and so one of those opportunities is going to be definitely accessory dwelling units, uh, junior accessory dwelling units. Uh, but it really is quite a challenge uh, in our city, specifically because uh, we are always uh, fighting the mandates. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't actually know about. Uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about housing in itself. And uh, so every uh, seven to 10 years, and I don't know why it's not an actual uh, time frame that is always set, but every seven to 10 years, the state of California uh, sends a number down to municipalities, which SANDAG is a member of that. So that, it, that is all 18 cities plus the county of San Diego. And we have to figure out how to uh, address that housing. And as it's become more difficult to actually build housing, we know there are a lot of challenges and you all have, you know, you're selling uh, many homes and, uh, you know, in different uh, price categories. But for us as uh, elected officials trying to figure out how to actually build that housing, since we don't build it our, ourselves, we really have to look at how we are going to create those opportunities for private development to actually build the housing. So in San Marcos, uh, we have in the next RENA uh, Regional Housing Needs Assessment uh, timeframe that goes from now, it actually was 2021 through 2029, and, and just to give you an idea of what our share is, uh, countywide, it's almost 172,000 homes uh, that are supposed to be built. And unfortunately, uh, accessory dwelling units do not count toward that number. So whereas they actually can provide some relief, unfortunately, they're not uh, part of the number that we get to count uh, toward our regional housing needs or RENA number. And uh, so we have about 3,100 homes that we're supposed to build from now until 2029. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, that's out of the 100, almost 172,000 uh, homes. So for me, uh, elected like me, we have to figure out how to actually build the roads and make sure uh, we are providing uh, the infrastructure and we are not even in charge of that either. You've got to get the school district involved and then you have the water district involved if the city does not have their own water district or um, own the water district, which we don't in San Marcos, that's Valacito's water district. So you've got to bring all of these agencies together and it's not an easy task. Uh, so what we, what we look at in the city is figuring out how to, again, uh, you know, to address uh, the homeless issue, I think we've done uh, better than many cities. One of the reasons I believe that is, is because out of all of our housing stock, about 7% uh, of that, a little over 7% is deed restricted affordable housing. And uh, that is about 2,300 homes that are uh, specifically for uh, folks that are at the lower income levels. And then, you know, we're always trying to bring in that middle, uh, as I suggested before, and that is the uh, housing that is the workforce housing, because many of our firefighters and our workforce and our sheriff deputies, our teachers, and, you know, we have CSU San Marcos as well, a lot of employees there have to drive pretty far to actually get uh, to work. And so uh, out to, as far as Hemet, we actually have folks that live out in Hemet. And you, I know you all don't like to hear about that uh, because it's definitely um, housing the you know, uh, homeowners that, that have opportunities or could have opportunities here locally. So we're constantly trying to juggle and figure out how we can create that, uh, those opportunities 
So when uh, the state passed their um, accessory dwelling uh, units uh, legislation, and I'm going to try to share my screen here. I'm pretty sure I'm confident I can do this. Uh, there we go. Um, that is our city hall. It's a lovely city hall. Um, but anyway, so just to talk a little bit about our background, the background and the statistics. In 2020, um, all of the legislation was passed and it allowed the junior accessory dwelling units and the accessory dwelling units to be permitted. And so what we did is we actually um, took that legislation and we incorporated it into our city code. Uh, but, but it also uh, created some things, some changes that we had from our regular accessory dwelling units prior to the legislation uh, passing. So that was changing the setbacks and the, um, uh, the amount of uh, space between the infrastructure or the structures. And then also no setbacks are required for an ADU which converts or replaces an existing building within the same footprint. So we have done uh, what we needed to do as far as incorporating the states. And again, I, I'm, I'm against mandates, uh, but I, you know, there are many times that there's nothing that I can do about that. Um, but we definitely want to uh, create the opportunities and you could just read through that slide. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I would like to leave some uh, time for questions. Uh, but anyway, this kind of goes over a little bit of the um, uh, state legislation that we have incorporated. And then uh, one thing that I would like to just bring up quickly, and that is uh, SB9, that is some more legislation that has been passed as of late uh, by the state of California. That actually changes more um, in what is happening in the city as far as uh, single family residential zoning. And don't be surprised, by the way, if it seems like the state of California is trying to eliminate single family residential zoning, because I believe that is the case at some point in time, um, because if you're going into uh, different uh, neighborhoods and you're now changing opportunities, um, it, 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 really, it really does change the characteristics of neighborhoods. So just to give you a little bit of background about our statistics, I mean, if you look at uh, 2017, we had about three uh, permits for the uh, ADU. Um, and 2008, none, which is really surprising, uh, but we didn't. And then if you look at, you know, it's gone up from there. And so uh, four in 2019, 2020 was 13. And then 2021, 42. So that is, uh, you know, quite a significant jump. If you look from 2018, uh, the first, uh, when, when I was actually elected as mayor, I didn't take office until uh, late 2018. But if you, if you just look at what's happened, I mean, the, the upward trajectory is definitely that folks are uh, trying to figure out how to have multi-generational um, living within their properties. And oftentimes they can't do it in their actual home. So an ADU is an opportunity to do that. Um, but then also looking forward at 2022, we've already had uh, 16 in the first four months of, of the um you know, of the year. So a lot going on, I think, as far as ADUs, I think you will be seeing that more often. Um, again, you know, a lot of uh, housing affordability issues are really facing our residents. And now with um, even further having all of the inflation and how expensive it is, yeah, our houses are worth a lot on paper, but if we cannot afford to move elsewhere and actually replace that home, that really uh, gets people stuck to where they're at in their home, which isn't good for you all, um, being that you are realtors and you do need to sell uh, homes. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, you know, moving forward is going to be a big challenge as far as cities grappling with uh, the legislation that keeps coming forward, and then also how we encourage um, you know, folks to actually uh, continue building in a way that makes sense. And we are going to have some, no one wants to hear this, high density in uh, some of your um, areas that makes sense, more of your downtown areas in San Marcos specifically, that'll be more of the North City area a little bit maybe in the Creek District, but I certainly don't uh, foresee that happening, for instance, in Twin Oaks, uh, you know, Twin Oaks Valley or, or places like that where it tends to be more rural. I think the characteristics of our communities would be too drastically changed, and so I'll definitely continue to fight on that. Um, but anyway, I, I would like to open it up for questions uh, because I, I know a lot of times things that I said may have uh, brought up some uh, thoughts and, and questions. So anyway, I'd like to open it up for questions. And 
I, I forgot to ask Lydell, am I supposed to monitor the chat room or is someone else doing that? No, someone else is monitoring it. Perfect, um, okay. We don't have any questions as at the moment, although I do. Of okay. the 43 um, ADU permits that were allocated, how many of them were actually completed? Um, I don't have a number on that. I, I suspect that most of them have been uh, done because generally, um, unfortunately, it does take a long time to process things. I do know that a lot of folks, you know, have said, hey, you know, we want to we want to move forward to actually build an ADU. And I said, well, then you need to get it in right away. And I'll just tell you an example. Um, one of um, my my friends actually lives a couple miles away from me over in the uh, Silvergate uh, area. They had uh, wanted to put on an AD or add an ADU to their property. And, you know, it takes a little while for that to actually get go through the process because, you know, the staff has to you know, continue to make sure that it's it's meeting all the requirements. And, uh, you know, and then you've got the, um, you know, you got to make sure that uh, the water district is on board and they're able to uh, do all the things they need to do on there and to hook up to that sewer and everything. So I do know that it, you know, grappling and bringing together all the different agencies does uh, slow things down a bit. But as far as I know, everything has moved forward and actually been built. Oh, Lydell, you're uh, muted. Sorry. Thank you. Um, looking for a question. I don't. Oh, will move able. This is from Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. I think it's Stephanie. Um, will move able tiny homes be included with California permits and approved? I'm not quite sure I understand. Will. I think she might mean more. I think she might, will more tiny homes be um, permitted? Yes. I, I think that might be what she's saying. So, you know, honestly, I'm always uh, open to any opportunities to have housing. I'm not sure if you're, if you're aware, but uh, San Marcos High School actually had a, um, a, a collaboration with uh, Wounded Warrior Homes where they built a few, I think there were three, two to three of them, I, I'm not sure of the number, uh, tiny homes that they were building for veterans, uh, veteran specific. I would love to see more projects like that actually move forward. The real, the real truth is uh, we haven't had a lot of um, uh, folks coming forward on things like that, which are more of a, uh, a larger scale project. And I don't understand why, because I mean, the truth is when it comes to affordable housing, it's so extremely expensive to actually build that housing. Uh, there are some, uh, some numbers that are from four to uh, six, uh, 700,000 per unit, which is astronomical. Then you change that to a small home, a tiny home, and that, that actually could be a quite a game changer. And then when you've got uh, the BIA that has worked with uh, the school district, that was a BIA uh, collaboration with San Marcos High School. I, I think I didn't mention that. Um, also with the uh, Wounded Warrior Homes, which Wounded Warrior Homes was able to place those homes. I think as, as people are thinking more outside of the box and there is more housing or uh, more dollars to actually build that housing. And, and let me say that one real quick. One of the biggest uh, issues to actually building affordable housing is not actually getting it um, approved because I, I, have a, I have been very consistent in approving that. Uh, in my time on the council, I think we built over almost 550 units in the city, wow. which out of the 2,300, it's, it's a lot. Um, so I've always been a big proponent. I've never voted against an affordable housing project. But again, back to what the real concern is and why that doesn't happen more often is really the financing of it. So when you, when you have opportunities for someone that wants to invest in a tiny home uh, project, I would be 100% open to figuring out how to make that happen because I think we do need to think outside of the box and think differently about how we can actually build affordable housing that it really provides um, a, you know, a roof over someone's head. And I don't mean to get political, but I truly don't believe that um, a car roof over someone's head is a home, I would much prefer to see them in a tiny home, something that really can help them uh, get on their feet and uh, provide the services and the opportunities for them to actually uh, be able to find a path to home ownership if that's a possibility for them. What a wealth of information you have. 
Thank you. Mayor, you have lots of other questions, but in the interest of time, um, will you be able to stay on and maybe answer them at the end? I will be able to stay until about uh, 3.30. I have a 3.45, which is why I'm zooming from my car. You can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, I actually, I will make sure that I share my information. Um, anyone can reach out to me. I always meet with folks. I, I think it's a very, um, I, I, I pride myself on my accessibility. I agree. I agree. So um, our next speaker is going to be Kathleen Bigelow. And Kat, she has been on the ADO, ADU panel um, a couple of times as well. So thank you again for taking the time to be here with us. And um, here's a little bit of uh, information about uh, Mrs. Bigelow. Growing up in San Diego, in San Diego East County, um, with a small granny flat, a home with a small granny flat rented out to help pay bills. Caitlin saw for herself the many financial benefits ADUs provide her parents and the stability it brought her to, uh, to her young family. After sweeping litigations that the mayor was just speaking of, changes, the, she, found, she founded Maxible to help more families like hers reap the financial and social benefits. So I, um, Maxible is the name of her com company and she's gonna explain a little bit more about that with us. And with no further ado, Hi, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. Um, excited to share all about ADUs with you guys. I think this is gonna be information that if you're interested in ADUs for yourself, hopefully will be very helpful. But even more so, if you have clients that are interested in ADUs, I hope this will be information you're, you'll be able to share with them as well. Um, just to give a little bit of background, what is Maxible? So we help homeowners plan their ADUs and we help them source designers and general contractors for their project. We hit 300 ADUs this month, so we were very excited. Um, we've helped homeowners all over San Diego County, um, LA, and even up into the Bay Area. And so we have a lot of experience with rules and regulations, budgets, permitting, kind of all of the questions that you guys are going to have. So let's talk a little bit about everyone's favorite topic, which is what does this cost? You know, I think a lot of people are excited about the opportunity to do this, but they don't have a good grasp on what numbers are going to be. And so I would say that the number one question that we have been asked is what is the cost per square foot of a unit? That is a very difficult number to answer. And part of the reason is that there's a lot of different factors that go into determining costs. So if you have a sloped site, it's gonna be significantly more expensive. If you're trying to build up, it's gonna be significantly more expensive. Um, we had a, two projects, uh, two clients in San Diego, they had identical floor plans for their garage. One ended up being $120,000 all in. The other one was $170,000 all in, and it was the same general contractor. And the reason in that $50,000 difference was in the level of finishes one of the homeowners chose. She was planning to live in it for herself. She wanted all super high-end finishes. She wanted custom built-ins with lots of extra special storage. Um, and so that pushed the project into a much more expensive. So you actually have a lot of control over the level of finishes and like certain decisions you're making. Ultimately, when you're looking at the cost, and I am going to give you guys some numbers in a minute, when you're looking at the cost, the larger your unit, the lower your cost per square foot is going to be. Um, and obviously, that's because there's a lot of fixed costs associated with these. So like a kitchen and bathroom um, are expensive square footage, and that can't be amortized over, you know, a big great room or big living rooms and lots of bedrooms if you have a very small unit. So that's just to kind of something for you guys to keep in mind. Now, if you're looking at general costs for an ADU, um, the hard costs, which means just the construction costs, not the soft costs, which would be the design cost and the permit fees with the city, um, these are going to give you guys some examples of what we're looking at in terms of cost. So garage conversion, your hard costs, your construction costs are around $100,000. Um, that sounds really expensive to people, um, you know, and I think that this can often kind of give people sticker shock. But if you look at, okay, if I were to finance that entire, you know, the entire project out of pocket, what would my monthly loan payment on that amount be? It'd be around $520. 
And what could you then rent that unit for? You know, a lot of places within San Diego um, have, you know, these beautiful neighborhoods. Rents are very, very high. Um, and so often the cash flow numbers, even though the, the cost of building an ADU can be quite significant, you can still have amazing cash flow if you're looking to rent it. And then on top of that, you also have the added property value. So um, Zillow did a study recently saying that if you're building an ADU in an urban city, it's typically ad adding an average of 35% value to the, to the value of the property. Um, so that number is pretty astronomical. If you have a million dollar home and you're adding an ADU, on average, it's adding $350,000 in value to the property. So these are, this, this is a big deal. And as realtors, I know that that's something that should excite everyone here. Um, let's talk a little bit about timeline, because as the mayor referenced, these can take a long time. But remember, this is something that's going to be on your property for 100 plus years. Um, so patience is always an important virtue. Um, generally, the financing of this can take anywhere from two to three months. You want to have a conversation with a lender early in this process so you can understand what are your limitations around budget. It's great if you want to build a 1,200 square foot ADU, but if you're only approved for $150,000, there's a big delta you need to overcome there. So it's good to have a conversation with a lender early in the process. Um, design usually is taking about two to three months, um, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, and then permits, we're seeing, even though uh, you know technically permits should take around two months, that was a mandate set down by the state that said, hey, your permit needs to be approved or denied within a in a 60 day period. We are not seeing that that's the case. So we're seeing permits take anywhere from three to five or six months, unfortunately. Um, and then from there, you're going to move into construction. Um, construction again depends. We you know I've seen units be done as fast as three months for garage conversions. Bigger units can take longer, so you've got some kind of wiggle room in there. And then obviously you can move in after that. But ADUs go beyond just the financial benefits. And so when we look at all of the 300 units that we've helped homeowners build at this point, the number one reason why people are building an ADU is actually for uh, their family members. Um, and so 61% of homeowners are building an ADU to help um, house their aging parents. Um, and I want you guys to think about this in context because yes, these units are expensive to build up front, but we pulled data on what does it look, what is the cost of an assisted living facility over a 10-year period and it's more than a half a million dollars and that doesn't bring added value to your property um, so if you're looking instead at building a beautiful spacious two-bedroom ADU in the backyard for two hundred fifty thousand, that's going to add value to the property that you know could be rented out and then have a parent, fa uh, family member move in that is a lot of value you're bringing to your property um, young adults are also reaping the benefits. So this actually was a unit in San Diego. Um, the parents were retired. They had a daughter who was married and was getting ready to have a baby. And that family was looking all over San Diego to try to buy a property. They were getting outbid. They were frustrated. I know that you guys all have similar experiences here. The market is so crazy. And they finally said, you know what? We just can't afford this. Like, what are we going to do? And the parents decided, you know what? let's build a 1200 square foot ADU in the backyard. It's the size of a, of a house anyway. Um, they've got built-in childcare at the front house with grandparents um, and they spent about $300,000 on the project. Furthermore, the grandparents are now reaping the benefits of having a huge increase in the value to their property. So there's a lot of opportunity for here for people. Now, when you're thinking about building an ADU, you really need to hire two crucial people your designer and your general contractor. So I wanna walk through a little bit um, of these types of people and kind of what you should look out for and what the red flags are. So I think most people when they're hiring an architect, um, they tend to think that it's just a floor plan, right? Like, okay, I'm gonna you know, draw out the living room and the dining room and here's the, the flow, but the designer is actually responsible for quite a bit more than that. Um, so first they're gonna have to analyze your property. Um, they're looking for feasibility of an ADU project with all of the new regulations that have been in place. Um, this is actually, they're so much more feasible than they used to be. So we've had sweeping legislation all across California. Um, all jurisdictions have removed minimum lot sizes. Um, all jurisdictions have rear and side setbacks of four feet, if not less. Um, 
You don't have to add parking within, if you're within a half a mile of public transit. You don't have to add parking if you convert your garage. You can convert any permitted accessory structure into an ADU without having, and it can conform to whatever the current setbacks are. So there's really some fantastic regulations in the space. Um, but your architect or your designer is gonna be looking at the feasibility of the law. They need to look at utility connections. That's a big one. Um, they're gonna look at things like easements. Do you have a sewer line or some kind of electricity easement running through the property? Is there any unpermitted work that we need to think about? So they're responsible at the beginning for really thinking through all of that. On top of that, they have to obviously design the unit, right? Um, but it's more than just a floor plan. They're gonna be thinking about how do we place the windows so that you're gonna get maximum privacy in the main house and privacy in your rental. You know, if you're building this as a rental, I have a feeling that you probably don't want your renter staring straight into your bedroom window, right? There's a, a lot of complications of putting an ADU. You have to figure out there's already an existing house. How do you make it fit on the lot in a way that makes sense? and maximize these usage for both properties. Um, finally, your architect is gonna be responsible for developing a full set of construction drawings. Typically, these drawings are anywhere from 12 to 15 pages. They're gonna have the foundation plan, they're gonna have the roof plan, um, they're gonna have the electrical plan, um, there'll be structural engineering calculations that'll need to be submitted to the city. There's going to be Title 24, uh, Title 24 calculations, which as most of you probably know, that's the energy calculation required by the state. Um, so these plans are very complicated. When you have the full set of construction drawings, you're getting close to being able to submit for permits. After you get all of this, there's, there, your architect or designer is going to package everything in a way that the city needs to receive it. Um, once you submit to the city, we've seen that some cities have been slow to adopt, adopt some of the new state regulations. Um, we had a homeowner in LA tell us, you know, I went to the city three or four times, talk about a runaround. There was maybe one nice person out of 10 I spoke to, and I left even more confused than when I first got there. Um, unfortunately, this isn't something that's super unique or that we hear rarely. We hear this quite often. Um, one of the things, not to throw cities under the bus, but you know, they're busy, they're understaffed, they have a lot going on. One of the things that they tend to do is put their more junior planners at the front desk. Um, and so it can be hard to get answers because the senior planners are the ones doing the red line corrections in the back. Um, and so it's not uncommon for people to go to the city multiple times and kind of get different answers depending who they're talking to. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's so important to work with someone that really has experience um, working within that city and understanding the regulations. Um, your GC has a big job to do too. Um, so there's kind of two types of general contractors that we've seen operating in the ADU space. One is of a larger firm. So maybe they have a showroom and they tend to have, instead of using subs, they tend to have more of all of the, the specialties they'll need in-house. So people are employed with that company. That adds a lot of overhead to the project uh, or to their operating expenses. So if you're working with a larger GC firm, they're generally doing a lot more volume. You may be paying a bit more. Now, the other type of general contractor we see working on these type of projects is someone who has a network of subs. So maybe they're operating out of their home or a small office or uh, maybe even their truck. Um, and they need to have a really good network of electricians, plumbers, carpenters, landscapers, things like that, um, so, that you, so that they can get all of the projects done. They also are having to strategize with the supply chain. So there's a lot going on with supply chain right now, as you guys have probably seen in the news. The fact that you have to source so many raw materials for this project means that you know, there can be delays that are impacted. Um, so a good GC is thinking about or knows what materials are gonna be back ordered, um, wondering if there's alternative products that maybe would work just as well um, that they can swap out for, understanding if there's a surplus on something they can get a good deal on, and they need to source all these different um, you know, uh, products and raw materials for your project. The next thing that the GC is doing is really mapping out this very complex timeline. So not only is the GC you know, coordinating with the city to make sure the city inspector comes on time, um, they're managing the homeowner's expectations. If something like weather pops up and causes a delay on the project, then maybe they're going to lose, like, let's say they had, you know, a framing team that was going to come out and work. Luckily, we don't have a lot of weather in San Diego, but let's say it rains. 
and that framing team can't come on site, that framing team is probably working on a bunch of different projects. So now they might go to a different project. You can't get them for another week. The city inspection has to be delayed an extra week. You finally get them back on site. So you're constantly playing this kind of game of like making sure everything is moving smoothly through every, you know, moving uh, smoothly through all the um, process and that the work is being done to a high standard. So those are really the roles of the designer and the general contractor in your project. And they have an oversized responsibility in making sure that your project is a success. So it's really important to hire the right people for that. Um, and if you need help with that, we're here for you. We have a network of architects and designers um, and general contractors that we work with all throughout San Diego County. Um, you know, we'd be happy to lend advice and get you guys connected to good people. We also help homeowners with early consultations or if you guys have clients you wanna help with on ADUs, we're certainly happy to advise. And then one little shout out um, that I wanted to mention um, that Shirley said I, I could talk about because I think it will be interesting to you guys is now that we're coming out of COVID, we're actually going to have a live event um, where we talk all about how to kickstart your AD project. We'll be bringing in city planners from the city. Um, and then the thing that I'm most excited about within this event is we're going to do a whole citywide ADU tour. So um, this citywide ADU tour will have more than 10 units on the tour that you guys can drive to. It'll be like realtor open houses. Here's um, three of the units that have already been confirmed for the tour. The one on the left and the bottom one are garage conversions. The one on the top is a standalone unit. Um, and so the homeowners will be on site, the general contractors will be on site, the designers will be on site, and you guys can drive around, tour the different units, get design ideas, get inspiration. Um, I think it's gonna be a really fabulous event. Um, if you guys are interested in, in checking that out, you can go to adutour.net. And then we set up a special promo code for everyone in the webinar. Um, so it's NSDC webinar, and you guys can get $20 off that full weekend pass of tickets. Um, so I'd really encourage you if you guys are interested in ADUs or if you have clients that are interested in ADUs, um, it'll be a really cool event to check out. And, very, uh, very informative as always. Thank you so much for all that information. And I think you actually answered a couple of questions that uh, oh, some people had for our mayor regarding ADUs. Um, so Stephanie was actually referring to uh, ADUs not on pads, but on wheels. So uh, our, she was asking about permits for those and whether or not that's something that is um, as easy to do. Yeah, so I would say that the tiny homes, the legislation really hasn't caught up with the demand. Um, and so, you know, it kind of reminds me of like where ADUs were back in like 2015 before we really saw this like sweeping statewide legislation. I think there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of enthusiasm. The cities don't always know how to handle that because there is a building code for a reason. There are uh, the reason the building code, code is in place is to make sure that um, structures are safe for people to inhabit. Um, there's also infrastructure demands on the city, right? They have to be able to connect into sewer and the electrical grid. And so I think cities are still trying to figure out how do we kind of navigate this need for more housing, more affordability, increased density, but at the same time, how do we ensure that structures are safe for people to live in? How do we regulate those structures? Um, so technically tiny houses, movable tiny houses or tiny houses on trailers are actually regulated by a completely different body than the building and zoning department. They're actually regulated by the same body um, that would regulate like trailers, trucks, um, RVs. Um, so it, I think there's still a lot of work that we're going to need to see for that to be a viable solution. That was a great question and a fantastic answer. Um, you do have a couple others, but again, in the interest of time, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to our next panelist, and that is Van Vanessa Posh. Um, she's been working as a pan uh, planner and planning with the planning and development services for nine years. She reviews building plans for residential and commercial development and reviews projects to make sure that they are com in compliance with the local and state ordinance. That is such a short little snippet of 
what I know Vanessa does because there's so much more. <laughs> and Vanessa, welcome again. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be one of our power panelists. Thanks, Lydell. Uh, yes, so let me start my screen share. Okay, and you guys can see that, correct? Perfect. Yes, we can see Okay, it. so I am here to share some updates on our ADU regulations within the unincorporated areas of the County of San Diego. Um, also discuss JADUs and a couple of updates. Third item would be ADUs on a multifamily complex and ADU fee waiver program, discuss our pre-approved plans, and also briefly discuss Senate Bill 9. So for our ADU regulations, I know, you know you, most of you are familiar that they are 1,200 square, square feet max, require four foot setbacks in the side and rear, but they do have to conform to the front yard setback. One of the recent things that changed was we used to enforce the exterior side yard setback. So if you were on a corner lot, you would have to meet the front yard setback and the 35 foot exterior side yard setback. Well, we actually just recently changed that where if you're on a corner and you're near two roads, then you will only need to take a four foot setback from that exterior side yard and or four feet away from the edge of easement or street. Um, so we now allow the four feet on an exterior side yard setback. Um, and another item that's recently changed is the parking space. Yes, only one parking space has been required um, unless you're within a half mile of transit, but we used to enforce the uh, setback requirement for a parking space. So we used to say that it had to meet the front yard setback and it depends on your zone. So each parcel has its own setback designator. Um, it could be a 60 foot setback, front yard setback. But right now, we, or now moving forward, we say the parking space can be located within that front yard setback and it no longer needs to meet that setback. Um, another update recently that's just changed is an existing and permitted accessory structure or a portion of the existing and permitted main residence can potentially be converted into the ADU. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a 3000 square foot permitted barn that's been on the property. You could essentially convert that entire structure into an ADU. Um, so another uh, thing that just recently changed was um, if you have, let's say you have an existing uh, house or an existing garage or portion of a house that has an attached garage and it's located within any of those setbacks, we don't require any additional uh, setbacks. So you could essentially convert that non-conforming portion into a ADU or junior ADU. Um, and then properties that have two or more existing non-conforming single family dwellings and non-conforming to us is just essentially a grandfathered in. So if you had two houses on a lot and you're in a residential zone and the current zoning doesn't allow it, because you do have those two non-conforming houses, we would allow you to have either an ADU or JADU, so not both. Um, and then properties that have an existing non-conforming single family dwelling that are in a zone that does not allow for a single family dwelling, um, we would also allow only one ADU or one JADU, not both. An example of that would be, let's say you have a house that's currently zoned commercial, but at the time you have a house that was permitted back in the 1950s or prior to zoning. It's a non-conforming house. It was done there with permits. Then we would say, you know, it is non-conforming, but we will allow one ADU or JADU. Uh, the junior ADU, um, some of these are consistent with the previous uh, rules and regulations. It still cannot exceed 500 square feet 
it still must be contained entirely within an ex existing single family dwelling. Um, separate sale or ownership of a JADU is prohibited um, and it can't be used or rented for less than 30 days. Um, another one thing that's changed though with the JADUs is we no longer require interior communication. So you can see in our previous exhibit here, we used to require this open interior communication between the JADU and the primary residence, where now we say it's up to you. You don't have to keep it open. You can completely enclose it and just require, we do require that separate entry um, for exit or in, an entry. Um, we also, um, we do require the owner occupancy. And then we do also require that the JADU um, it must be served by the same water, sewer, and any other utility. So we won't allow a new meter, essentially. You know, you can't come in for a new meter for the JADU. Since it's connected to the house, it still needs to be served by the existing utility connections. And then, of course, there are no parking requirements for JADUs. Um, if you have a multifamily complex on the property, um, we do allow only structures or rooms within this existing complex to be converted into a ADU and only up to 25% of the existing multifamily dwelling units. So let's say, for example, you have four, a four lot uh, apartment building, you could and you have this unused or not unused, but a laundry room that's not habitable, you could essentially convert that one laundry room into an ADU. And that's for attached. So for attached ADUs within the multifamily. For detached, if you do have a permitted multifamily complex on the property, we do allow up to two detached ADUs um, that could be potentially permitted. And then that's assuming that, of course, they do have to meet the four foot uh, rear and side yard setbacks. And then an interesting thing about the ADUs located on a multifamily is that the maximum height allowed is only 16 feet. Um, for the ADUs located on a multifamily complex, which is different because on a regular residential lot, which is a single family dwelling, the ADUs could be up to 24 feet max in height. Um, if you do have a non-conforming multifamily complex, um, you are allowed, um, a non-conforming multifamily complex can have up to two detached ADUs or have ADUs created within the existing multifamily complex. Um, and the way we count multifamily complexes or are two or more units. So I know most of us think of a multifamily as three or four, but the county does consider a multifamily complex having two or more permitted units on the property. And then currently the county has a five-year trial period that we're doing um, a fee waiver program on. So we are currently at year three and it will extend, it will go until January 9th, 2024. So this does include a waiver of the permit fees, um, but it does not include any other associated fees um, such as your school district, your um, water department fees or fire, the fire, your local fire fees. So you will wanna check with those local agencies to see what those kind of fees are looking like for you. And we also currently provide these free pre-approved building plans. We have four size options available that range between 600 square feet to 1200 square feet. We've got six different floor plans available. Um, and then one thing to note about this though is that they are only 85% complete. So you still need a plot plan, a stormwater plan, energy calcs, which is the title 24. Uh, trust calculation. So you will need to hire an engineer, um, a licensed engineer or a licensed architect to provide those type of um, the remaining items needed for building pl permit plans. Um, we do have these plans that are available um, to be downloaded from our website. And then we have the CAD versions so that you could make minor modifications. But if you do plan to make any type of modifications to these pre-approved plans, I would recommend coming into the office and speaking to one of our structural engineers just to make sure that um, they're not, you're not making such large changes where it would modify the pre-approved engineering on it. You kind of just want to use it as a guide. You could also use it as a guide to creating your own home for uh, a single family dwelling or for the ADU, a custom house. 
Um, and so I wanted to take a couple minutes to discuss the Senate Bill 9 that the mayor had touched on previously. Um, so SB 9 was, um, it was, it was created to allow more housing opportunities in our single family zones um, and through a ministerial review. So with that being said, this type of permit processing is not gonna require any type of environmental CEQA review. So these are, will be ministerial permits. We have two options available. Um, you can do where the lot split. So you could create two lots, a two lot subdivision, or you can do two houses on your two units, uh, two houses on your lot. Um, so there's two options available. Uh, for a parcel to be eligible for a project of SB9, it cannot be located within any of the following. It cannot be located within a historic district or California historical resources inventory or historic property. Can't be located in prime farmland or farmland of statewide importance does not contain wetlands, is not within a 100-year floodplain or within a floodway, a hazardous waste or hazardous list site, or a very high or high fire severity zone, um, or be located on a delineated earthquake fault zone, uh, or located on an area identified for conservation, an area containing habitat for protected species, or land under a conservation easement. So, the County of San Diego on our website, Planning and Development Services, we do have this interactive map, which kind of lists out all of our parcel eligibility information. So you can enter in your address or parcel number, and it will tell you whether or not the property is eligible for SB9. So this is a link to the website right here. Uh, you can also go to Planning and Development Services uh, website and it's on our um, most popular pages under SB9 and we have a lot of information on their checklist. We have all of the lists that I had just previously showed. We have applications, all of our project applications. We even have a list of exemptions. So for example, there is, let's say a property is potentially located in the uh, high fire zone. Um, we do have a uh, link on there where you can kind of go and see who is your local fire authority. You can reach out to them and see if there's a way to mitigate some way, somehow come up with a fire plan and still essentially be eligible for SB9. Um, so I highly recommend check out our website um, and see if your property is located on a property that does qualify for SB9. Um, and I think you'll get a copy of this uh, presentation so you can always go back and see this link. Um, so an example of a two unit on one lot would be kind of similar to this, this example right here. You have this existing home and then you could essentially place the second home on there, um, assuming that it does meet all of the eligibility requirements that were previously mentioned. And a lot of those items on that uh, list are coming from the state. So there's statewide lists that we ha have that would indicate, hey, this is a um, hazardous site. It's considered prime farmland um, or it is or isn't a urbanized area. So a lot of that is coming from the state itself. Um, and, then, and then that's it. Um, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to go to our website here on ADUs or feel free to send us an email at this uh, zoning email and staff will respond to you within 24 to 48 hours. Vanessa, 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 <laughs> thank you so much. I knew, see that little short title that I read doesn't hold a candle to everything that, uh, <laughs> that she does for us. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So you're, can you write down the actual email address or uh, URL? in the chat so that everyone has it yes i'll put it in the chat right now that that link to that map is is so nice i didn't realize that that was in existence so um so uh, back to the audience guys did i tell you you have your pen you have your paper you're taking notes because there's a wealth of information coming this way lots lots more to lots more to come looks like we have uh Jordan Marks next. How are you, Jordan? Well, I Dallas. Awesome. Good to be with you. Hello, my Always. friends at the North County Realtors. Always great Always. to be back. 
Ready to have a little bit of fun? I already see the tax questions going in the chat box. So don't worry, folks. I'm going to take you there right now. And we're going to have a little bit of fun. All right. So Jordan Marks is our taxpayer's rights advocate for the office of Ernest J. Dronenberg. Dronenberg Jr., sorry. Uh, San Diego County Assessor, Recorder, County Clerk. In his position, he, he assists taxpayers with navigating issues in the office. He also performs legislative intergovernmental relations for the assessor and helping uh, usher in the passing of an ordinance to adopt Proposition 171, providing taxpayer tax relief. Um, I'm sorry, providing property tax relief to victims of fires and other government declared national disasters. And he does so much more to help taxpayers. Um, he's done a lot for my personal clients. I, I, I Countless I've sent to him when they send me these crazy questions about taxes. And with no further ado, Jordan, you have the floor. Thank you, Lydell, and uh, uh, happy to be here. I'm actually now a chief deputy assessor at the office uh, uh, as of this year, so I know, but um, mostly operating as the assessor taxpayer advocate. So uh, we try to make it easy. Uh, as Lydell said, I work for Ernie Dronenberg. He is the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, Ernie uh, implemented the California Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which created the Office of Taxpayer Advocate. And so as your assessor taxpayer advocate, I work to ensure fairness, provide education and correct systemic issues. We always rely on our frequent flyers, the realtors that are helping their clients to send us all the ways that we can be better because we're trying to be the best. Uh, I'm an attorney and I'm a certified property tax appraiser and I fist bump people when we save money. So that's a good picture of that. Uh, we have five offices around the county uh, in the North County region. Uh, you can find us in the city of San Marcos. Always good to be here with the mayor. Uh, and we have uh, over 400 staff members and $80 million budget. Just a quick breakdown of what we do, because I know we want to get to Steve quickly, talk about funding. But uh, what we do so that way, you know, you can bring us your clients is we appraise real property that includes uh, real estate, uh, boats, planes, penguins. Anybody know where the penguins are at? I know Lydell's SeaWorld. Yes, that's right. Uh, we're really good at igloo appraisal. And uh, for the realtors out there, we do recording documents. So uh, you know you haven't officially closed on your deal until you're recorded. And we do same day recording. Uh, not every county does, but our realtor friends know if you're in by three o'clock, we're going to record you that same day. And that means your clients get their keys. So we're excited about that. <clears throat> also, the commissioner of civil marriages. We uh, uh, perform only the civil ceremonies, not the uncivil ceremonies. We leave that to somebody else. Uh, we focus on great customer service and uh, making sure that we operate at your needs. <clears throat> to understand uh, what we're talking about here today, one of the questions that we saw in the chat was, what happens to my taxes, right? So to understand our property tax system in California, you have to understand Proposition 13. Proposition 13 was passed in 1978, and it essentially created an agreement between you and the government that says, I, purchaser of property, agree to pay 1% of that purchase price in a fair and open market transaction. So that means, yes, if you have a great realtor like Lydell and he gets you a good price, that's what you pay it on as long as you negotiate it with somebody you know fairly. And uh, that amount can go up 2% per year. So uh, what we look at is if you purchased a home for 300,000 at 1%, you'd be paying $3,000 a year in property taxes. If it went up 2% per year over the next 20 years, then you would see what's called a 40% increase. Your tax bill, as in the example would show, would have gone from 3,000 to $4,146.75. I didn't include bonds and indebtedness. I know somebody out there is yelling, Melarus, Melarus. Well, Everybody has a different, what's called tax rate area. So if you wanna know your exact taxable amount, it comes down to some neighbors on one side of the street end up in one school district or one water district or one fire district, but you can look it up on the tax bill and it will tell you your exact tax rate. The nice thing about Prop 13, it makes 
home ownership, it makes housing and property ownership in California affordable because you can predict what your taxes are going to be. And because you can predict it, you can budget for it. So we like to say Prop 13 makes it affordable because it's predictable and budgetable. And we know folks like to retire. And a lot of the folks that are looking at ADUs are the retirees that are trying to supplement their income. So they want to know, hey, what am I looking at as far as my costs? Also, one of the things that happens, just a side note, Prop 13 locks it in. Even if the market jumps up, like we saw 29% this last year, your tax bill only went up 2%. If you were locked in under Prop 13, everybody has Prop 13. I'll get into that. 85% uh, of the homes this last year under Prop 13. But if it drops below what your taxable value is, that black line, we can actually lower your taxes thanks to something called Prop 8. That was passed by the voters right after Prop 13 that said, sorry, realtors, not the value doesn't always go up. Over the long run, we know it goes up, but sometimes it goes down in between. We can lower those taxes and help give some relief to folks. Uh, okay, ADUs, the granny flat, the in-law suite, the backyard cottage, the, you know, we've got a lot of names for them and uh, companion unit, but uh, basically, we understand you're building something in addition to your primary residence or uh, in addition to a property that you purchased that's already there that has a residential structure. Uh, they can be affordable. It's great for extended family. And state legislation said, yeah, by right, you can do that. Here's a couple of tips that I have along the way. I'm going to, I do a lot of presentations around the county. And my colleague from the county, Vanessa, did such a great job. She's amazing. But she gave you one jurisdiction's perspective. The county isn't, there's 18 other municipalities that operate throughout the county. So everybody has a little bit of different rules. So I try to bring some best practices. You know, I'm a little bird that goes to every jurisdiction to talk about the same tax law, but every jurisdiction has different AD rules. So Mayor Jones has different rules from the county and what Vanessa presented. So just make sure and I'm sure uh, Maxible and those folks will make sure they check the rules of where you're operating. But one jurisdiction that a lot of folks don't give consideration to is the fire authority. Every jurisdiction has a different fire authority and it doesn't mean necessarily because you're in one city, you have one fire authority that operates in that area. So you wanna check in with whatever fire authority that you're under to make sure that you understand their fire code and their rules and that won't impact you and your ADU opportunity ahead of you. And I always give a shout out to my county colleagues for having pre-approved plans. And as Vanessa said, it's almost 100%, but 85% there. You get take it the rest of the way. We're going to have a fun time. Also, ADUs can have their own mailing addresses. So just remember, you got to check in with the fire authority and the fire code, and they will help assign you that half number or whatever number that they can do to recognize a different address that's available. And the reason why the fire authority does it is because under the fire code, they have to identify how to get to each living part of a property. So they use it as a fire safety tool. And now they get the pleasure of assigning numbers. So make sure you check in with your fire authority when you're trying to get that 47 and a half number for your ADU. Okay, so assessments on ADUs. There's gonna be three different ways that we look at it there. Mostly that we see is the internal, that's the JADU, the attached, also a JADU or the detached. Those are the ways that we tend to see uh, 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 ADUs take place. Having an ADU does not trigger reassessment on the entire property of the land. So you can see my examples here. The blue may be where the additions were made, but the white portion of those properties are the original pieces. When you bought that original house and that original land, you locked in Prop 13 values on those properties. So let's say you have this detached home example here. You paid 500,000 for that. You locked in that 500,000 at 1%. Remember that's your agreement. And that amount goes up 2%. And you're like, but that same 500,000 today might be 1.5 million. And I don't wanna add an ADU if it's gonna re make sure everything goes to market value. It doesn't. Whatever stays that was already there stays at the value that is locked in by Prop 13 when you purchased it. But if you look at that detached example, that blue portion, that's the ADU that you added on, that addition, not the land underneath it, but just the amount that you've improved the land with, that gets added on at market value. And then we do what's called a blended assessment. 
So let's say you had 500,000 was that house and land, and then 500,000 is the value of the ADU, more likely like 250,000, we use 250,000. We take the 500,000, we add the 250, blend it together, and then we start locking that in at that 2% increase per year. So that's what's called a blended assessment. So no, ADUs do not trigger 100% reassessment of your land and property, only the improvement that is made. All right, well, there's a couple of ways that we look at that. So we have a new build ADU, right? That's new construction that adds value to the property. Good news is, let's say you don't have a group like Maxwell that's gonna help you walk through and you overpay for your ADU. You're like, oh man, it's only really worth 250, but with my construction costs and all these people that I tried to put together by myself, I ended up paying 350. We only tax you at the value that it adds to the property. So if you underpay too, let's say you're like, hey, I work at Maxible and I have all these inside deals and we have all these leftover wood and tiles and I have all these different pieces that I'm gonna grab together and I don't have to pay for it. We still enroll you at the market value. So if you paid 50,000, but it's worth 100,000, your taxable value increases 100,000. If you paid 200,000, but it's only worth 100,000, we only do it at 100,000. The other way to do it is to retrofit a garage. So if you add an ADU and you retrofit a farmhouse, I like that I like that example, Vanessa, taking farm to table here in San Diego County to a whole new level. So let's say you retrofit, a, we'll go with a farmhouse today. Uh, we're gonna look at what that additional value means, converting it from a farmhouse structure that may have only been worth $40,000 to an additional living one bedroom and one bathroom. Uh, that is how we do the market value. Now, whatever was already there in the structure, the outside and the land, that doesn't get reassessed. It's the internal portions that if you just said, hey, we, we put a, a bathroom in, we put a bedroom, and we have uh, market standards that are issued to us by the state, guidelines in our books on you know, how is the nice quality of the internal enhancements in addition to the market value of adding a bedroom. And so I know you're like, well, how much is a bedroom worth? Well, it depends. If you're making a two bedroom, one bath house into a three, two, well, those extra bathroom, you know, extra bedroom is worth a little bit more than if you make it a extra sixth bedroom or an extra seventh bedroom. Those have diminishing values in the markets. Also, if you add square footage, that also additional square footage gets added on. And we have general understandings, just the same way that you're trying to price out your square footage when you're doing your estimates, we do the same when we're adding value based on what we see in the community. Also, we get a lot of questions. Well, what if I have a building that is already there in ADU and Vanessa had referenced and you're just bringing it up to code? So that means that you're gonna legally add it there, but it was already there when you purchased it. If you bring an ADU up to code, so that way it's legally sellable and you know your realtors, you'll walk folks through, you'll say, well, this is unpermitted or permitted. For tax purposes, we actually don't, it doesn't affect us. So if a building is unpermitted and you bought the property with the ADU unpermitted and then you permit it, it will not increase your property taxes. Now, the reason why you wanna get it permitted is because of safety standards and making sure people are living in safe living quarters. So don't worry, tell your clients by making it permitted, you're not only going to increase the value of selling it, but also at the same time, you will not increase the property taxes. Now, if you built that ADU after you purchased the property and it's unpermitted and then permit it, and then what we call what's called an escaped assessment. That means that you did something that escaped our purview. We can go back up to eight years and we increase the value based on when it was built. So if you bought a property in 1950, and then you built an ADU in the 70s and we didn't know about it and it was unpermitted and then you decided to bring it online and we are now knowledgeable about this escaped assessment. We will put a value on that property and that building and that improvement from the 1970s, not based on today's values. So you can talk to us and ask questions and we'll look at uh, uh, the value of the property when it was added. So when we're essentially looking at valuing these additions, we do three value approaches. One is the comparable values in the community. So a additional room in Lakeside might be worth 
more or less than an additional room in Oceanside. We're going to look at equal square footage and, and additional room, uh, equal, you know, three bedrooms to three bedrooms, two bedrooms to two bedrooms. And we try to match it up as much as possible so that way we can add a fair value. The other one we do is replacement cost new. So after you finish getting that final permit from the, from the permitting department, we are going to get a notice of the addition and we're going to send you a letter that says how much did it cost you to build this ADU? What were your construction costs? That tends to be a baseline. These days with supply chain issues, we're actually seeing that at some point the, uh, uh, the goods to build may be out outpacing the market value. So we balance those two together. And then the third, and in this case, uh, if it's a commercial addition, it's income approach. That applies primarily to multifamily. So after you get the permit, watch out for that addition, that final permit, watch out for that sheet from our office. And I'd say be as honest as possible. It really helps us reach a fair baseline. And we don't want to overtax you at all, but the more information we have helps us do our job right. After you get that final amount, you're going to get what's called a supplemental tax bill. That's going to add or supplement that property taxes from the period upon which you've purchased. Once you have that in hand, you're gonna have 60 days that you can appeal that. Come talk to us right away if you think that the numbers are off. We're here to work with you and we try to resolve things at the lowest and most informal level. All right, some cool things in the valuation. There are some housing commissions out there that are giving bonus density for ADUs. That's really outside of more of the residential scope and the multifamily scope, but we see that in the city of San Diego. If there's a deed restriction with a jurisdiction, we can account for that in lowering the property taxable value of that addition. So if you sign a low income deed restriction where you can only rent out the property for such value for so long, we can actually reduce your property taxes to match that. All right, a couple of hot topics that I see around the county is uh, we're seeing some delays in the final permits being issued. A lot of jurisdictions are still impacted by COVID, so have patience. But at the same time, everything that we do is based on the lien date. So January 1st of each year, we look at a property to see what the value is. If the permit gets issued on 1231, we'll add that additional value for the next upcoming tax year. If it gets done on January 2nd, after the lien date, we don't look at it until the next tax year. So those are some things just to consider uh, uh, that, that may be impacting you. Also, Prop 19 happened. In 2020, the voters passed Prop 19, which allows seniors, those over 55, to carry that Prop 13 locked in tax base to another primary residence. If you have a primary residence that you're selling and you're like, I'm going to take my low tax base to another property, if you're renting out your ADU in a commercial way at the time of sale, we do not count the ADU towards that uh, benefit that percentage of the property that used for commercial purposes doesn't count under Prop 19. So just be careful and watch and be mindful. If you have questions, you can reach out to our office. If it's not rented though, and you're using that ADU for a family member that gets included in your primary residential price sale and the amount that you can carry over. Also SB9 lot splitting, we get a lot of questions. Do I get reassessed if I split my lot under SB9? And the answer is no. Similar to what I just explained with ADUs, your taxes only increase with what you build on those lots after you do the lot split. But the land itself and the structures that were there beforehand do not get reassessed. We are seeing some appraisal issues in the market. We're seeing some market rate appraisers, and I think Steve will get into this, so I don't want to get too deep, that are not necessarily valuing the ADUs at what they're being paid for in the market. So our office is watching that. So let's say you get a market rate appraisal for that ADU addition and they're saying it's only worth 150,000. That's important information for our office because again, we can use that when we put the right taxable amount for that addition. Not necessarily what you paid to construction, but what the value is in the market. Uh, lastly, uh, two things that I think are, are key. Uh, there is a solar credit. We are seeing a lot of homeowners also thinking, well, if I have an ADU, should I add solar? Because in the rental, uh, market, you can actually pass that solar or electricity charge onto your tenants at market rate, or you just want to mitigate everybody's costs for electricity and be a good person to, you know, family and, and renters. And so in that case, uh, solar is non-taxable and the solar credit 
are reducing in the upcoming year. And lastly, supply chain issues. We're seeing a lot of folks that are building ADUs and the doorknobs and the garage doors and the different pieces aren't arriving. So I would definitely make sure you order early, get there and have it on site ready for building. All right, I have some great samples of ADUs that you can look at. Uh, we did develop a handbook with the city of San Diego on ADUs. You can go to their website. Vanessa gave the information for the County of San Diego. For homeowners, make sure you're taking care of uh, advantage of our homeowners exemption and reducing your property taxes $70. It's on your tax bill in the top right. If you don't see the 7,000, you're not saving. Let me know, I'll help you out. And also, I wanna thank the North County Realtors, a great partner in delivering savings for disabled veterans. So if you're a homeowner that's also 100% VA rated disabled, we have an opportunity to save you property taxes. Thank you so much for having me and I look forward to being here to answer any questions anybody has. Take care. Jordan, 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 thank you so much. Again, a wealth of information. Uh, I just, this panel, it's, it's the power panel. You, you wanna know where to build, you wanna know how to build, you wanna know what you can build or can't build. This is, this is the panel. Lastly, we have Stephen. <laughs> Stephen oh, Campbell. Hello, hello. Stephen is a, oh, let me, let me tell you about Stephen. Stephen Campbell has been a mortgage loan originator for over 21 years. He opened Mountain West Financial Incorporated in Fallbrook, the Fallbrook branch in 2013. Steve re received Mountain View West Financial's Top Producing Diamond Club Award in 2019, 2020, 2021. Mortgage Exclusive Magazine's Top 1% Originator in the U.S. for 2019, 2020, 2021. Also, Scotsman's Guide Top Number One Originator. Again, 2019, 2020, 2021. Respectfully, Larry, I'd like to correct that stat. I am not Scotsman's top originator. I'm in the top 1%. Top 1%. There you yes. go. That's, I, I thought I threw the 1% in there, but uh, nonetheless, yeah. uh, that's, those are some pretty powerful shoes to fill, my friend. It all happened while I wasn't looking. Uh, those are stats given so they could be searched and sourced by corporate to make sure that, uh, you know, that that's what, that's what they've given me to share with, with everybody about my short bio. Right on. Appreciate well, I think that you're, you're kind of the glue that holds all this together. So how does this happen? Talk to us. Well, and, and that's, that's when, when I want to thank Shirley Carroll for reaching out to me to, to, to be on the panel and help, help try to make a little bit of sense because everything that these, that these panelists do put together, it doesn't happen for a lot of people unless they have the cash, right? They have to finance it. And the definition of what's financeable is out of the control of the originator, but it's the originator's job to help direct people to it and make sense. I really want to put a, give a Jordan fist bump to Caitlin. Her presentation to me was a bit eye-opening. Um, uh, respectful to the realtors um, that, that are listening and as an affiliate, I want the bulk of this to be uh, what's, what's available financing for purchase. So, so you, and from what I've seen and, and what's available for financing at ADU, you got the homeowner who has seen amassed a pretty significant amount of, of equity if they've owned their home over the past few years in our county. And, and a cash out refinance proceeds is a very simple way to acquire the funds to finance an ADU. Um, something I took advantage of, uh, you know, I was faced in, in at the beginning of 2017 with twin boys finishing high school wanting to go to Cal State San Marcos and the cost of dorms and, and food and housing for them for, for that adventure in their life, uh, it, it actually penciled out to exceed what the cost of building an ADU here and having them housed here was. And I got to control my neighbors, right? Get them out of the house, house to ourselves. And they're right across the, the garage on the lot. Um, had I had exposure to maximal space at that time, I can tell you the, the challenges I was faced with to get the engineering and planning and all of that done, I was kind of left to, left to our, our own. And so really, Caitlin, wow, 
you know, you're, you're really providing a service. I wish I had back then. Uh, that said, we added 1,100 square feet. They've lived in it since then. They're done with school, but think about what they went through. You know, it turned into what was going to be, hey, a way to offset the cost of dorm expenses and keep them close to home. We really love the guys. We didn't want to kick them out. And uh, at 2020 and beyond, and their school career was at home all the time. They were here, like the whole time. So it, it, it really worked well for us. Couple that with aging parents. A cash out refi satisfied those needs and worked out very well for us. Home equity line of credits, also something available to the homeowner. Uh, but, but for our affiliates out there, I really want to talk about, okay, what about we've got, you know, we've got a challenge in the market now where we've got deferred properties as a focus and, and the possibility of improving them and adding an ADU through a purchase. And I think this is the topic that, that it's going to be interested uh, for most of the realtors out there is how, how does that really fit? How does it work? How does it get started? And or what are the complexities? How do we solve problems before it starts? As an originator, I feel that's my job. You know, there's always a problem when you have a, to finance something. The, the lender originator's job is to, to, to kind of wrangle all of those problems and find that path of least resistance to an end result that's, that's beneficial. And, and uh, what started, I think back in 1978 is, when, is what I saw FHA launched the 203K, which was a renovation loan. I get a lot of requests for that, and I find it becomes challenging. Those who've been in the market as realtors and trying to use a 203K over the last few years might give me an amen. It's a little bit tough. It's a little antiquated. It requires contractors to be certified through HUD, things of that nature. And that became a hard stop because even though you go to a facilitator, you pay the extra cost, there are added um, upfront mortgage insurance premiums and things like that that can that can just make it hard for the borrower to fit in, in, as well as the whole project itself. Coming into 2017, I would find myself as an originator trying to help seek somebody's 203k needs, calling a, a facilitator, getting the list of contractors, calling the contractors and having them tell me they're not interested, they don't want to, they're not participating anymore. And it kind of for me at least became a little bit of an arduous test. Not that I wasn't successful, but I could definitely see that it needed some streamlining. Um, subsequent to that, in 2019, Fannie Mae released Homestyle. They launched that product program. I don't think it got enough exposure. And that's kind of what I want to focus on, at least with the rest of my presentation. What I put together on a slide is a little bit of a comparison to the two to kind of open up maybe some of our affiliates' eyes to how that works and, and i also want to yeah we're not seeing your deck i haven't put it out yet okay just want to make sure no and that, that's okay yeah appreciate that that yeah i want to make this com comparison i wanted to talk about caitlin what i wanted to do was talk about the easy path for homeowners but for our affiliates the deck is simply going to be a comparison of those two i think 203k is a familiar program and again, might be met with some of the familiar challenges, but I don't think that the home style has been as exposed because being released in 2019 with 2020 and 2021 being, uh, you know, with investors and lenders being highly impacted by volume, it didn't quite hit the mark, I don't think, for exposure. So I'd like to share my screen now and uh, let's see if that plays well, is, can we see me now? All right, great. So one of the key, um, key pieces that you wanna see up front as an originator, you've gotta make sure that, that Jordan's definition of an ADU and Caitlin's definition of an ADU is the same as Fannie Mae's definition, so that you're trying to finance an equal, you're not coming to a hard stop in that. And theirs, theirs is in line, this is straight from their, their site, you know, typically individual, uh, an additional living area, independent dwelling. I like the fact that they do include um, detached on that too. So you're not hit with those questions of, well, can we do a detached ADU? And, 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 and basically they, they step out of, of uh, driver's seat there and make sure that as long as it meets um, county requirements, setbacks, things, things that Vanessa had spoke about, that, that it's going to be financeable. They kind of get out of your way there. 
second slide is, is another very important one is what construction method of an ADU? And as I was looking at some of the questions, a, a party had mentioned tiny homes. Now, something on wheels, I don't think ever becomes a financeable unless it's permanently attached. However, in their definition, they do say site built or factory built. They do go into single and multi um, HUD code manufactured homes. Guys, that's, a, that's about a 45 minute seminar in and of itself. So I'm gonna leave that for any questions you wanna talk to me later on how a manufactured home might be an ADU. For the topic of this conversation, we're talking about site built or a factory built or prefab modular that you can come set in place. I think everything that Caitlin had showed and that have been talked about would fall under that category. So we're still in line with what we can finance through a program like this. Um, and getting into a comparison now, what I, what I led up with, with the 203K, something that's a, you know, been here for a long time and people are more familiar with, and what Homestyle did to try to ease that path there's three key elements we'll get to. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, they, they'll end up to 97%. And it gets a little complex when you go, well, what's the limited to 75% lesser value purchase price plus reno cost or as completed uh, appraised value? So for, for, for ease right now, I'll say if you've got a $600,000 purchase and renovation or, and cost of an ADU at 150 or 200 as dictated by some of the previous panelists, those combined costs times 75% is what they're gonna say is your maximum lendable um, renovation funds up to 97% of its completed value as a max. So they're really not staying, they're not throwing curveballs that step out of feasibility. As you compare to the 203K, it's, it's uh, your standard is the only one that allows a, a detached or an ADU to be built. The limited really is not relevant to this part to an ADU conversation. So, so familiarity to those programs are gonna be on case by case. For the right buyers, I'd say, someone who's finding it a little harder to meet debt ratio and, 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 and uh, what would be considered conventional uh, qualifications, a 203K is still there. I don't want to discredit it altogether, but I do like some of the other comparisons um, that it can be used on any project. It can finance the ADUs. Again, standard can do that. Limited cannot. Um, applicable to manufactured homes, yes. Again, total different subject and, and education needed on that. So we'll put that on the side for now, but you can check that it is, it is eligible for that product. Um, allows upfront draws up to 50% material cost. We'll kind of go a little bit into that. And there's a nice one, two, three at the end to explain that disbursement schedule. 15%, um, these contingency allowances are important in your pre-development and, and approval just to make sure, you know, when you're if you're going to add on or do a garage conversion or go over the top of a garage with something, having contingencies available in funds is, is required by these because once your contractor puts a bid on a job, once he gets in there, uh, you know, I think it was Jordan that mentioned, you know, some of the cost of materials have outpaced a little bit, having those contingencies in place is sure that you got enough funds left to finish the project. So it's important to make note of that as you're setting the scope of your project. Um, easy loan delivery is not applicable to borrower. That's more for the lender. Um, same with rep and warrant, warrant ability, um, can use any contractor or subcontractor, check yes, no to government uh, programs. And this, is, this has been, in my opinion, one of the key setbacks to 203K is, is that contractor participation because they have to maintain HUD eligibility and be acceptable to waiting to get paid. And in this case, uh, obviously, you can use any contractor you want. And if you yourself are a contractor buying a home, think about the opportunities there when the funds can be used for materials and you can handle your own contracting needs. Uh, it, it becomes, I've helped many do that, and it becomes uh, just a, a very fruitful opportunity for them. Um, requires proof of completion. Now, this has to, for, for the government side, you have to kind of go through all the way through that release notice, which can take a little bit, quite a bit more time, whereas final disbursement to the contractor and completion is a form 1004D, meaning appraisal, the appraiser 
is a beginning part of this to help assess that as completed value at the beginning of your pre-development uh, console and designs and things of that nature. And then they come when it's once it's phased, approved by the county and signed off, the appraiser comes in, signs off, it's complete, it's complete, and then your final funds are dispersed. So it does get a lot of that out of the way. Service and transfers is for lender information. Um, I think this is an answer to a question within that Fannie Mae that you know it may be detached from the primary dwelling related to an accessory unit must be in compliance with local and, and, and state codes and ordinances, which I think fits well with Vanessa's presentation and some of the things that uh, Jordan and, and the mayor was talking about. Um, this is kind of a one, two, three they put up. I like I like to put that in the slide because it kind of shows how the how the lender and the appraiser with the design and contract are kind of work together up front to set the scope of what your max financeable funds are for the renovation side. Now, when you're purchasing a home uh, for my for my affiliates out there, that purchase contract doesn't really get compromised for ownership. The money gets put into custodial account. The escrow officer will then, as at the lender's instructions, release those funds as each phase of the, of the completion uh, begins, or rather is completed. Um, so it kind of gives you this step one preparation. Step two, lender sell. Now this part, there's an asterisk here. It's in both sides. It's up to the, it's up to the lender whether they actually sell the loan prior to completion or not. That's gonna be investor specific. Um, but they place that those funds, contractor begins work, the upfront fees are sent out. You can close that purchase through that process as, and then all of this starts to uh, take place at the end. Um, blocked on some of my things here, but it, it, kind of, it kind of shares your finalizing of that loan process. And if the, the what if sold or not is again, a bit lender specific. Um, something Caitlin had brought up in our pre-discussion, and sadly, I wasn't very familiar with this, but I did call Cheryl Silva with CalHFA, whom we participate with, and their ADU grant program works with any of these, in, any of these topics uh, of financing, whether it be 203K or, or conventional, and it gives you up to $40,000 of that pre-development non-recurring costs which would be site prep, design, permit, soil test, impact fees, property survey, and energy reports, things of that nature. So you, you would then to kind of help set the scope of how that works um, and a little bit of history behind it. It didn't get a lot of traction. It was released, I believe in 2020 and originally, but it was set at an 80% of area median income and they funded zero. As of March, 22, she advised that she, she shared with me that they raised that limit to 188,000, and uh, they've been able to fund since March of 2022. They've been able to 14 to date is what they're at. So, the first trust deed is still controlled by the lender. That is the the loan for the for the for the uh, in this case a home style loan. Let's say you all of those fees are covered within that loan, but you start it. The upfront fees go out. At that point, your lender, if you're qualified, if to each buyer that would be eligible for this, they would then simply submit that grant application with those costs identified. And then that money comes in from them as a grant and it just lowers the total loan amount at the end. It's still the loan that funds the transaction. It's a grant, it's not repaid. It's not something carrying, you know, uh, carrying with the note or something to be repaid. So definitely a good, uh, a good uh, prospect for those who are gonna be eligible for that. And let's see, last, I wanted to end with just some best practices if you're financing an ADU. Set that scope, bring those cost and financing options into place. I would strongly advise talking to somebody like Caitlin at Maxwell Space. Just be, mind you guys, I never saw her presentation before, but first hand experiencing it, second hand being an originator and trying to help wrangle all this at the lender's responsibility up front can be very complicated and cumbersome and somebody as well versed as, as Caitlin is, I think would be helpful for anybody to get everything set up so that your lender can do their part and make sure that 
you know, not one size fits all here. It's going to be buyers that qualify, borrowers with the right quality, you know, set scope properties as well. And not just with the ADU, but it can, I, I kind of feel like something like this can be applied best for, you know, somebody. Um, one that we've put into play was, was, you know, mom, aging mother out of state, sold her place, had some additional money. And uh, the kids, they bought a place that had needed some renovations, some upgrades, and then an added ADU fit their needs perfectly. So getting with the lender, you've got to put all of that together up front so that when you do identify the property and move forward with it, you're not set with surprises and, and trap doors that could stop your progress of completing the project. Um, and then for the realtors uh, out there, just be mindful if you are looking at a purchase and a home style or 203K type of renovation loan to, to successfully uh, do it, you wanna make sure you give yourself enough time. The aggressive offer of a 20 day close with a 10 day contingency removal probably isn't gonna fit well when you've gotta get contractors, appraisers and all of this stuff in place up front. Uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that you, you're talking with your lender, sending your scope appropriately and the right property and the right buyer can successfully do this. Um, I, I have also, lastly, because a lot of the weight of this relies on the appraisal, far be it from me as a lender to uh, pretend like I know all of the ins and outs of what an appraisal's responsibility is. So I had Kimberly Hyman uh, assist me and give me this narrative, this, this, uh, this appraiser's opinion, and uh, hopefully it helps our, our our, our realtors out there, when you when you discuss an ADU and how much value and how is how is this as completed value impacted from an existing property that you might be targeting and a completed and improved property, her her statement was this, and, and just to let you know, Kim Iman is a trusted panel appraiser for me for over over a decade up in North County here. And she's become just increasingly valuable. She's with Integrity Value Valuation Solutions. Her statement to me was, Stephen, Southern California has experienced significant increase in auxiliary dwelling units, ADUs, granny flats and casitas. Many cities have waived their user fees and eased laws to promote ADUs being built in single family residence. A small ADU is two to 600 square feet, typically costs 150, 200,000. A larger ADU, six to 12 is 250 to 350,000. I think that does fall in line with what Caitlin had presented as well as ex expected costs. That's a sliding scale. Um, along with size, bedroom, bathroom, condition, quality of construction, site age, and site age, style, and location, there are many factors to consider when appraising a unit. The appraised value of an ADU using the comparable sales method is best captured with the gross living area of the subject property. This means appraiser would be used similar adjust, excuse me, similar adjustments to the market reaction to a gross living area of the main home and apply the gross living area of the accessory dwelling unit. But in addition to having similar sized, um, they would, they, in addition, they would want comparables with similar sized ADUs that appraisers would consider its features, most times the best way to extrapolate the value is using a paired sales analysis to compare what typical buyer would be willing to pay for a comparable guest house. Having full kitchen garage would typically increase the value of the ADU and thus must be supported by similar comparables in the market. Her last statement here is many times the value of an ADU is also directly related to income. And if the property is rented or intended to be rented, the rental analysis could also be performed showing three or more similar market rentals to the market to determine a gross rent multiplier. That gross rent multiplier has significantly increased in Southern California due to limited inventory of homes and increasing prices. So when supported, the income also adds value to the property, to the appraiser's overall opinion. Now that's a lot. And whenever lending or appraising or talking real estate, there's a lot to digest. So if anybody's eyes are glazing over right now, I apologize. I feel like my panelists ahead of me are much better than I am at presenting something that's a wow factor and it's surprising, but I think it has to do with the subject matter of lending versus what we can do and what they're doing for the ADU. So I- Mr. Campbell? Yes, sir. I, 
I think you did a fantastic job. You well, you got you. you you went into the weeds and uh, presented us with some information that um, I was actually not aware of. So I really appreciate that. Um, I know that some of the panelists probably have to take off. Um, Shirley, is it okay if we stay a little bit longer to answer some of the questions? Looking at the Q and A, it looks like Vanessa and Caitlin are. And, and Jordan are readily in there just making changes and answering questions. Um, I, I don't know if there's a whole lot lingering, uh, but Mayor, I think that you do have to go. And thank you so much for um, gracing us with your appearance again. And uh, all of it's your my wisdom. pleasure. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And anyone that wants to reach out to me, I did uh, forward off my email. Uh, definitely reach out to me. I'd be happy to sit down with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. My Del, Thank uh, you. I did have one thing that came up just as I heard Steve talking. Is that okay if I add that in? Yes, please. Uh, one of the things that we are seeing with the Fannie and Freddie loans, and Vanessa hit this on, uh, on this as well, is that our internal assessor codes, we list an ADO on the property as having two structures, which then puts it as multifamily. And so we've seen some hiccups in the lending process where Fannie and Freddie won't lend on it, but then our office actually will issue letters identifying it as a single family residence. And we've helped uh, realtors work with their lenders to get it approved by Fannie and Freddie. Oh, so and I, know, uh, I, know Shirley, Shirley, I, I know Shirley wanted to hear it really, you know, so, uh, but uh, just something that our office is here as a resource. And we want to help uh, if you do get caught up in that category uh, the, the it, it's almost like Fetty and Franny are using our internal coding inappropriately, but we'll help work them through work them through it. Awesome. Any other final tips? Okay, suggestions? We can stay on as long as the the agents um, have questions and the panelists want to stay. We're good to go. So right, it's up to you. All right. Let's do it. I, Let's I do have it. to jump off, but thank you everyone for having us. I'm happy to support you guys if you have ADU questions. Um, and maximalspace.com is a great resource. And hopefully we'll see some of you guys on the ADU tour. So thanks again for hosting. This was a great event. Thank you again. And uh, to be continued with you, my friend. <laughs> Take care. Um, so I think, you know, I, I do think that all of the question and answers were asked and answered. So um, I think that's gonna, it's gonna do it for this panel. Thank you guys so much again, and really looking forward to the next one, which is probably gonna be completely different from this one because that's how this works. <laughs> thank you, Idell, wonderful job moderating. And thank you to all the realtors being there to get education on behalf of their clients. Happy to help, thanks. Right on. Thanks guys. Oh, and big, big thanks to Shirley. She, she and her team are just absolutely amazing for putting all these together. So big hand, thank you so much. I should have done that sooner and multiple times, but this doesn't happen without, uh, without Shirley and, and uh, North San Diego County uh, realtors. So thanks again, everyone, and make it a good rest of the day for you.